Thank you so much for having me, and it's a real honor to be here. Just a minute before I stepped out of there, the wheels were turning in my mind, thinking how fast our lives really move. A week ago, my colleagues and I, we were in Grand Cayman Islands doing a week of meetings there. This last weekend, we were in Newtown, Connecticut, thinking back of what happened there 14 months ago. Quite a tough setting, dramatic switch from almost a vacation terrain to soil and roofs that now have 26 stars on them to memorialize the tragedy that took place in December of 2012. From here, day after tomorrow, we move on to, at the speak of the governor's prayer breakfast in Anchorage, Alaska, and following that on to the University of Uppsala in Sweden. And I'm sitting there with the head spinning, thinking to myself, my goodness, how fast life really moves. All of Cayman Island, the Grand Grand Cayman, has uh, 50,000 people in it. It's probably more than that in your university here. A uh, tremendously different challenge that you face in every different setting. I want to speak to you tonight, and I know many of you primarily have been um, coming here to enjoy the worship, enjoy the proclamation of the word, and God's given you a great leadership team as we've worked with them and the faculty network to speak to you tomorrow night on this idea of absolutes, God or no God, is relativism really to rule the day or are there ontic reference for the points of absolute by which you and I must govern our lives. Since we'll be getting into some pretty heavy thinking on both nights, uh, tonight really I want to speak to you as a sign on the subject of faith in the 21st century. Uh, I'm going to do it more in terms of defending the faith in the 20th century, 20, 21st century, so that we can keep the main idea implicit here, but at the same time go a little bit beyond that. But before that, I want to read for you a little lighthearted story that hopefully will uh, get a few laughs out of you and moving then into the heavier subject. Here it is. It's called a touching story. The heart of a musician. And maybe the brain also. As a bagpiper, I play many gigs. Recently, I was asked by a funeral director to play at the graveside service for a homeless man. He had no family or friends, so the service was to be at a pauper cemetery in the Kentucky backcountry. As I was not familiar with the backwoods, I got lost. I finally arrived an hour late and saw the funeral guy had evidently gone, and the hearse was nowhere in sight. There were only the diggers and crew left, and they were eating lunch. I felt bad and apologized to the men for being late. I went to the side of the grave, and I looked down, and the vault lid was already in place. I didn't know what else to do, so I started to play. The workers put down their lunches and began to gather round. I played out my heart and soul for this man with no family and friends. I played like I'd never played before for this homeless man. And as I played Amazing Grace, the workers began to weep. They wept. I wept. We all wept together. When I finished, I packed up my bagpipes and started for my car. Though my head hung low, my heart was full. As I opened the door to my car, I heard one of the workers say, Never seen nothing like that before, and I've been putting in septic tanks for 20 years. <laughs> There's nothing like bringing the wrong message at the wrong time, at the wrong place, and being profoundly moved, only to find out it was the wrong audience, the wrong subject, the wrong event. And so as I come here, I think it's just hitting somebody in the back sections out there. You might be able to replay it and get the full, full thrust of it. What I want to talk to you tonight cannot obviously be done within one brief talk. But we are Christian apologists. The word apologetics really comes from the Greek. It is transliterated from the Greek. The apostle Peter uses it. Paul uses it. It emerges many times in the New Testament, either specifically in word or certainly in concept. And 1 Peter 3.15 says this, Always be prepared to give an apologetic. The English word used there is a reason. Always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that is within you. 
but do that with gentleness and respect. In that simple description, the talk of Christian apologetics is defined. Always be prepared to give a reason for the hope of anyone who asks that of you, but to do that with gentleness and respect. In other words, it is not a militaristic term. It is a dialogical term. It is, it is a term that engages the mind and the heart and has respect for the person who is asking the honest, daunting question. That's the way it is intended to be. And the tragedy of our times, I find, going from one place to another often is how easy it is to lose civility when the disagreements run deep. And when you lose civility and anger takes over and rancor comes in and some kind of I want to win this argument attitude takes over, you really lose the substance of what it is that you are discussing. For example, for a person like Richard Dawkins, uh, in all of his uh, strident atheistic uh, movement, one can respect the fact that even in his naturalistic framework, that's the direction he wants to go. But the attitude, the term, the, post the terms, the posture of mind with which he sometimes engages it was very well disclosed when in Washington a questioner asked him, how do you deal with those who actually have religious belief then? What do we do with them? Dawkins looked down and said very simply, mock them, ridicule them. That was his answer. Ironically, he was a professor at Oxford University, the motto of which is the Lord is my light. Now, somebody said to me, what do you think of it? And rather jestingly, I came back, so taken aback by that, and I said, uh, I, would, I would fully support him and uh, tell him he needs to do that and let him start doing that mocking in Saudi Arabia. I said, the good news for him is he will only need a one-way ticket. He won't need to be flying back to <laughs> Oxford after that. And at least he will find out that all, not, all religious faith is not created equal. How does one respond to a person who exploits the beneficent attitude of an audience that takes the Christian ethic and is willing to engage in dialogue and argument and obviously mockery and ridicule is not uh, a noble response from any good thinking mind. I want to bring to you this evening as best as I can the dramatic changes that have taken place in our world, especially in the West, in the 20th century. There are four or five extraordinary changes that have taken place, and how then the Christian faith is to be uh, contextualized, presented, defended, and seen as authentic in this plurality of worldviews that we now uh, confront. I was 20 years old when my father, we lived, I was born and raised in India, born in Chennai in the south, raised in Delhi in the north, so spoke both of the languages, Tamil from the south and Hindi from the north. My dad worked for the Indian government. And when we were about, when I was 19 years old, he told me, I just entered university, and he said he was making arrangements to move my older brother and myself over to Toronto to try and study there, build a future there, and if all went well, to move the family over there. So that was in the mid-60s. One year later, when I turned 20, my older brother was 22, and I went, and we arrived in Toronto, Canada. And now, having spent over four decades of my life in the West, I have to say to you, the changes that I have witnessed in this span of life that I've spent for four decades in the West has been absolutely astounding. I've spoken across scores of universities in the Middle East, Far East, and Asia. Never once have I ever spoken at a university, even in the Middle East, where students were holding placards or something blocking my entrance to come in and speak. Never happened. And yet, a few weeks ago, in one of our Ivy League schools right here in the United States, placards being held to demonstrate against the controversial views what controversial views? We were there to speak on the defense of the Christian faith. And that very morning from uh, Jakarta, I got an email 
from somebody who said, I hear you're going to be on, on one of the Ivy League campuses and uh, I'm going to be holding you up in prayer, thinking about you as you face a hostile audience in the United States. I said, wow. My, how things have changed. How does hostility accomplish intelligent interaction? The whole point of education is that somehow, even with our differences, an engaging mind can dialogue, discuss, disagree, especially in metaphysical issues. And yet somehow, at the end of it, even embrace one another and say, I may not be where you're at, you may not be where I'm at, but at least let's affirm each other in our humanity and the privilege we have of thinking these things through because ultimately the truth will win out at the end. So the changes that have taken place, absolutely incredible. And I want to point out four or five of them to you and then talk a little bit about how this thing we call the Christian faith, that term alone needs definition. It almost sounds like uh, the, that it strains credulity to have any religious belief, that faith is one of those terms that has no reason anchored to it. That is not the biblical idea of faith whatsoever that we must have faith and reason hand in hand and the rationality of our belief in God can stand the test of any scrutiny. But here it is, the four changes that I want to talk about. Number one is the popularization of the death of God movement. The popularization of the death of God movement and the stridency of willing to live with its ramifications. That latter part of the statement is critical to understand. Because you see, the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, whose father was a pastor, and both of whose grandfathers were in the ministry, Nietzsche sort of broke new ground as he walked away from his Christian faith in, in particular and religious faith in general. Had no such belief whatsoever. Spent the last 13 years of his life moving between sanity and insanity himself. But Nietzsche coined that phrase, God is dead. But Nietzsche recognized that if that statement were to be held and affirmed and believed, the ramifications were, were going to be dramatic for civilization. He used metaphors like this. Will there be any up or down left? Will we have to light lanterns in the morning hours? Who gave us a sponge to wipe away the horizon? What sacred games will we need to invent? in order to satisfy this longing within us. These were Nietzschean terms. Who gave us a sponge to wipe away the horizon? Will there be any up or down left? Will lanterns now have to be lit in the morning hours? In other words, he knew that the absolute was gone with the belief in God and what sacred points will we need to bring into our lives? Nietzsche, I, I respected Nietzsche for that. But now, we've got such a strident willingness to live with the ramifications. Listen to Dawkins at his British Humanist lecture uh, some years ago, uh, and, he, and, he, and he says this. For example, there was a well-known television chef who did a stunt recently by cooking up human placenta and serving it up as a pate, fried with shallots, garlic, lime juice, and everything. Everybody said it was delicious. The father himself had 17 helpings. A scientist can point out, as I have done, that this is actually an act of cannibalism. Worse, since cloning is such a live issue at the moment, because the placenta is a true genetic clone of the baby. The father was actually eating his own baby's clone. Now listen to this, these two statements here. Science cannot tell you if it's right or wrong to eat your own baby's clone. But it can tell you that's what you are doing. Then you can decide for yourself whether you think it's right or wrong. Brilliantly, with his empirical reasoning, he says, I can give you the facts. But then he switches to the metaphysic mode, metaphysical mode and he says, but then you have to decide whether that's right or wrong. I really cannot tell you that. And what I think we are running up against is this tremendous tension 
between the empirical method of the naturalistic framework and taking the single finger of empiricism and thinking therein we have grabbed the fist of all of reality. It was the humanist Aldous Huxley who reminded us in these cautious words. He said, we are living today not in the delicious intoxication of the early successes of science, rather in the grisly morning after, where it has become quite apparent that what science may have actually done is to introduce us to improved means in order to obtain hitherto unimproved or rather deteriorated ends. That's in his book, The Ends and Means, writing in 1946. You see, even as I stand before you, the whole world is taken up with the loss of one plane. I've flown Malaysian Airlines many times. I have friends who are on the, on the crew there, pilots or flight attendants. I instantly wrote to several of them and got some messages back. The ones I'd written to were obviously safely on the ground, but some of their friends were in the air. Why are we so intimidated by the loss of one aircraft? Because the damage that one aircraft can do to millions of people. What is naturalism going to tell the one who is maybe contemplating such thing, who knows? Isn't it strange that all of a sudden our focus has shifted, even forgetting that 200 plus were on board, hoping we can at least find the aircraft because all else that can be done with it. It's a fearsome territory in which we exist, believe me. And as I, as they use the word crisscross, as I crisscross the globe many, many times, we've been in extremely precarious situations. And as we get out of there and get out of those situations, we just breathe another sigh of relief. Ladies and gentlemen, technology has been a marvelous thing to enable us to accomplish so much. By virtue of technology, I'm speaking to you. By virtue of technology, I flew in here. By virtue of technology, at the end of this day, I can talk to my wife, to my children, and even send messages to my grandkids and so on. It's a marvelous thing, but it is not self-evident as to how technology can govern itself ethically. It is not self-evident. That has to come from a transcending worldview that addresses capacity and the potentials that we now live with. And so when a person like Dawkins and the others talk about the popularization of the death of God and are willing to live stridently with its ramifications, to be honest with you, it's a very daunting prospect. Last week, I received an urgent letter from several leader, church leaders in Ukraine. Could you please come here? We need people to be addressed. Our country is in turmoil. Annexations taking place, and the heavens knows the heartaches and the brokenness and broken lives. You see, we have to think carefully that the death of God can open up a whole world without a horizon, without any up or down, lanterns needing to be lit in the morning hours. Is there any right or wrong left anymore? And so the second change I moved to brings a counter perspective, but with its own treacherous terrain. It is this, it is the gathering storm of religious pluralism that entered the West and disoriented Western culture. There is a good side to this. Pluralism is a good thing because there have to be a competing number of worldviews amongst your options, and then by truth you select which worldview is best. Pluralism itself is a legitimate expression of a diverse society. It has to be, it needs to be. God himself, in sending his son, entered into a pluralistic society. But here is how the, the trouble really begins then. Listen to the words of Swami Vivekananda speaking in 1893 when he walked up to the lectern at the Conference of World Religions in Chicago. As far as I remember, he wasn't on the program when I was reading the notes and the history of it, but, uh, it, uh, but, so, uh, but at least his speech occupied such popularity amongst the audience that it catapulted him into fame in the West and he was doing the rounds of the universities afterwards. Here's what he said. We who have come from the East 
has sat here on the platform day after day and have been told in a patronizing way that we ought to accept Christianity because Christian nations are the most prosperous. We look about us and see England, the most prosperous Christian nation in the world, with her foot on the neck of 250 million Asiatics. We look back into history and see that the prosperity began with the invasion of Mexico. Christianity wins its prosperity by cutting the throats of its, his fellow men. At such a price, the Hindu will not have prosperity. I have sat here day after day and I've heard the height of intolerance. I've heard the creeds of the Muslims applauded when today the Muslim sword is carrying destruction into India. Blood and sword are not for the Hindu whose religious is based on the law, whose religion is based on the laws of love. Courage. Powerful statement. If I were there, I'd say, Mr. Vivekananda, I want to ask you a question now. Crunch the timeline and move forward into our time and ask Vivekananda this question. Just a few short years ago, two New Zealand missionaries, Graham and Gladys Staines, doing their work in India. He takes his sons, I forget it was two or three boys, little boys, and he's in a van in Orissa, finishes a meeting and comes back. A group of Hindu radicals surround that van lock the doors, douse the van with kerosene, and burn him and his boys to death. Mr. Vivekananda, is that Hinduism? Is that Hinduism? I thought you said it doesn't deal with the sword. You know what he would say to me? That is not Hinduism. And I would say to him, I agree. Now, why do you judge your own belief with its legitimate expression, but you condemn another belief by a caricature and the abuse of it? Augustine said, you never judge a religion by its abuse. So the caricature that he made, the distortion that he made in, 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 in attacking all of this seemed so powerful at that time. And yet, as you look back on history, you see this huge tidal wave of religious pluralism and the sudden disorientation of Western culture. Let me throw out a real pointed question. I want you to think about this. When you take a statement like this that framed this nation, that we hold these truths to be self-evident, there's natural law right from the beginning, that we are all created equal and endowed by our Creator with inalienable rights. Take that statement, truths to be self-evident, endowed by our Creator with inalienable rights for the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. I dare you to ask yourself the question, is there any worldview other than the Judeo-Christian worldview that would have given birth to that statement? See, there's a backdrop to it all. Why did the masses come here? Why did they pour out of many other parts of the world for the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness, which is the gift because of the intrinsic worth of every human life, which is a God given to you and to me? You as young students have an incredible future ahead of you that could go in one of two different directions. And it's going to be the values that will take America's greatness into the future. If those values are lost, you simply will just have existence, but meaning will be compromised in the process and truth ultimately decimated. So you see the popularization of the death of God. You see the gathering storm of uh, religious pluralism. And number three, the power to inform through the visual. The power to inform through the visual. I think this incredible capacity we have to enjoy the beauty on a screen, to see the spectacular sights and events from around the world, it is an incredible gift, but it also lends itself to extraordinary manipulation. William Blake, writing long before television was ever even thought of, said this about the, eye, about the eyes. This life 
tints this life's dim windows of the soul, distorts the heavens from pole to pole, and goads you to believe a lie when you see with and not through the eye. This life's dim windows of the soul distorts the heavens from pole to pole and goads you to believe a lie when you see with and not through the eye. In the Blakean challenge, we are being told we are intended to see through the eye with the conscience. When you end up seeing with the eye, devoid of a conscience, you make a caricature of reality. Because in reality, Simone Weiss said, nothing is so beautiful as the good. Nothing so full and continually surprising as the good. Nothing is so monotonous and boring and disappointing as evil. In reality, nothing so enchanting, so perpetually novel as the good. Nothing so monotonous and boring and disappointing as evil. She said, but in our imagination, it's the other way around. Fictional good is boring and flat. Fictional evil is varied, intriguing, attractive, and full of charm. Do you get the point? In fiction, Evil becomes attractive. Good becomes monotonous and boring. In reality, it's the other way around. And so with the eye gate that is now catering to you and to me, and all the havoc that this has created, Ben, I cannot thank you enough and your leadership team for what you've done in raising funds for the needy and the exploited of this world. My daughter Naomi is only yay high. She runs a ministry in our organization called Wellspring International, rescuing women and children from the sex trafficking industry. If you've seen the movie Slumdog Millionaire, that very street that's featured in there is where Naomi first got the calling for her work. And she is, uh, she, you know, she'll put a little New Testament in her purse and walk into the brothels in, Bel in, in Holland, in Bangkok, in Mumbai, pull that curtain behind her as she goes. The, the, the girls behind these curtains in Amsterdam now know her, Nimi as we call her. And she'll just talk, they'll turn the light out for 15 or 20 minutes, talk to her, she'll pray with them, talk to them, try to restore some dignity and worth back into their lives and seeing such extraordinary transformations take place. And she told me one day, she, and she's been uh, talking to me about this on and on, she said, Dad, please write a book with me on the devastation of pornography. Please, she said. Because almost everyone I'm dealing with here who's a, who, who ends up being a client or, or destroying this woman, they're all take, they've all taken the root of pornography and the devastation to their lives, to other lives, and to the home. And I told her one day, I said, honey, I really don't want to get into this stuff and visually. She said, you don't have to do any of that. You just write what it was intended to be, Dad. I'll tell the rest of the story of what I see happening in the real world out there. And now through the eye gate, 11, 12, 13 year old boys are being destroyed that the price for which will be paid in years to come, possibly ultimating, ultimately even victimizing their marriages and their homes. The visual is a powerful medium, but extremely seductive. Extremely seductive. That's why Jesus said, let your eye be single. If the eye is the lamp of the body. If the light within you becomes darkness, how great is the darkness indeed. So these three realities, the stridency of willing to live with the ramifications of atheism, the tidal wave of religious pluralism and un unable to find a point of reference for truth in which way, and then through the visual, we find now ourselves asking the 20th, 21st century, how are we gonna live? How are we gonna find our way through this? And so I give to you some simple and quick responses here. Number one, we are going to have, we are gonna to need to have an understanding of what the gospel of Jesus Christ really is, its uniqueness, its distinctiveness, and why it is exclusively true. You have to know that. Let me just point out one thing to you, just one thing to you. I was talking to one of the four founders of Hamas. His name is Sheikh Talal. Let me introduce it this way and then expand on this for you. I was with the former Archbishop of Canterbury from England on a mission to talk to the religious leaders on both sides of the Middle Eastern conflict. And we'd spent time with many of them. And the last day, we had Sheikh Talal, one of the four founders of Hamas, solidly built guy, 
family members had been involved in suicide bombings and all of this tough individual. At the end of it, we were allowed to ask him one question, all five of us. The Archbishop was the lead man in the dialogue. The five of us were allowed to ask him one question. Since it was a private meeting, I won't betray the question, but I will tell you my response to his response. After he answered it, I said, Sheikh, my name is Ravi Zacharias. You and I may never cross paths again. Thank you for a meal. Thank you for your hope. Your family have been a wonderful host, but I didn't like your answer. I didn't like your answer, Sheikh. You have to know that. I said, let me just say this to you. Not far from where you and I are sitting is a mount up which 5,000 years ago, a man by the name of Abraham took his son to offer as a sacrifice, expressing his faith in God. Do you remember the story? He said, yes, I do. I said, let's not argue which son. Let's just agree he took his son up there. He said, okay. I said, he took his son up there, and as the ax is about to come down, God stops his arm. Do you remember that? He said, yes. I said, what did God say? He said, I don't know. I said, you should. I said, God said, stop. I myself will provide. He said, that's right. I said, Sheikh Talal, 2,000 years ago, on a hill very close to where you and I are sitting, God kept that promise and took his own son up that hill. And that time, the ax did not stop. I said, I just want to say this to you, sir. Until you and I receive the son that God has provided, we'll be offering our own sons and daughters on the battlefields of this world for position, land, power, and prestige. I said, that's what I want to say to you. The room was full of tobacco smoke, and it was like a greater cloud suddenly descended. And the archbishop said, I guess it's time to go now. I figured I'd done it. I got up. We're about to go down the steps, and the archbishop puts his arm around me and says, Ravi, that was of God. I said, I sure hope so. And then we're going down the stairs, and since the Archbishop, Archbishop is guest of, guest of one of the others of us getting into other vehicles, I little realized that he hurriedly put the Archbishop in him and ran towards me, and he twirled me around. He was a strong guy. He could have crunched me with a bear hug, really. He just turned me around. I've often told my, my, my family that uh, my friends, my physique is not exactly intimidating to anybody. Even my wife, once after I'd given her a big hug, holds me by the shoulders and said, I must tell you this, you have the arms of a thinking man. <laughs> uh, she's Canadian. What do you do with such unsubtle humor? So uh, I, said, I said, honey, I'll work on making my arms the arms of a non-thinking man. But he twirls me around. And I wondered what's coming here. Everybody is standing still watching this. He says, Mr. Zacharias, you're a good man. And he patted me on both sides of the face, kissed me on both sides of the face. I was looking at him eyeball to eyeball, and his eyes moist, and he said, I hope I see you again someday. Do you know in the gospel story do you know in the gospel story, it is the only narrative of any worldview and any religion where grace and forgiveness are central and unearned? Unearned. Take any pantheistic worldview. What is every birth? It's a rebirth. What is every rebirth for? To pay for the previous birth. This whole cycle has to be paid. You ask any other worldview, there's a payment, there's a payment, there's a payment. And yet one of the songs so beautifully sung, no, does it mean it's cheap? Absolutely not. It does mean that forgiveness is central. Grace is the underpinning of it all. And your life and my life finds its redemption because of a savior who is willing to take the penalty and the price for you and me. And in the response of the heart and mind, the life of gratitude is lived out in worship. 
There is a uniqueness. There is a understand what the terms are. Understand what you mean. Number two, it is going to take more than argument. It is going to take that which is visible in a world that really lives by the eye gate and watches it. And again and again and again as I've seen it, lives that have been beautifully lived have had the last word and the ultimate triumph. Go to Molokai in Hawaii where Father Joseph Damien gave his life coming from Belgium to work with the leprous people in Hawaii who were sent to Molokai and how one day he himself pouring a kettle of boiling water into a cup saw the cup's water swirling out, falling onto his foot and he realized he didn't feel it. Damien knew right then and there that in the process of taking care of these whom he loved and cared for, he'd contracted leprosy himself. If you go to Molokai today, you will see a grave. I went there, visited there with my wife, and I asked the man showing us around, so Damien is buried here. He said, no, sir. I said, but there's a grave marker. He said he was first buried here, but the Belgian government wanted him brought back, and the people with leprosy here begged them to leave him here because he loved them. But the Belgian government wanted one of their heroes back. They flew Damien back, and the people in Molokai asked for the privilege to cut that right arm and bury the arm there because it contained the hand that touched them. The triumph and the power of love, knowing what you believe, living what you believe. Thirdly and quickly, learning to defend both with head and with heart. Both with head and with heart. I don't have time to go into an ext in extenso here. Let me just quickly say this and move to my final thought. What is the pursuit of truth? How do you arrive at it? That's the central thing, isn't it? The pursuit of truth. You walk into a courtroom. If you're trying to get justice, you're looking for the truth. That's what you're looking for. When any conflict arises and you know you're in the right, what are you looking for? You're looking for the truth. Winston Churchill said truth is the most valuable thing in the world. It is so valuable that it is often protected by a bodyguard of lies. Andrei Sakharov, the Russian physicist, before he died, he had given to the Soviets the nuclear bomb. And his very statement is this, I always thought the most powerful weapon in the world was the bomb. I've changed my mind. The most powerful weapon in the world said he is the truth. And so, number one is truth. Number two, how do you get to the truth? Two, two areas, correspondence and coherence. Statements must correspond to reality. The worldview must be coherent. Correspondence and coherence. How do you test it? Logical consistency, empirical adequacy, experiential relevance. One, truth. Two, correspondence, coherence. Three, logical consistency, empirical adequacy, experiential relevance. Four, what are the questions? Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. One, two, three, four. Five, what are the disciplines? God, knowledge, reality, empiricism, ethics, God, theology, knowledge, epistemology, reality, metaphysics, empiricism, and ultimately ethics. These five disciplines have to be brought together to find the emergent answer of it all. Not a single strand, but all of them coming together. Truth, correspondence, coherence. Logical consistency, empirical adequacy, experiential relevance. Origin, meaning, morality, destiny, and the five disciplines. Work with your heart and mind to do your homework, to be able to give a reason for the hope that is within you. It's hard work, but then it is life-changing. I came to know Christ at the age of 17 on the heels of what my father told me. You will be a total embarrassment to this family. You will be a failure. It drove me to a bed of suicide when I was 17. As I stand before you now, half a century later, I never cease to marvel at the fact that lying alone in a room, having attempted to take your own life, and it was a servant who saw me unconscious and brought me in, otherwise I would have been a goner, servant in the house. And now I stand before you in audiences, 
because that day in the hospital room, somebody brought me a Bible. I'd never opened one on my own before. And there in John chapter 14, Jesus is talking to Thomas who went to India to proclaim the truth. The rest was history. My life permanently changed and the experience of knowing the living Christ has been the most precious and beautiful and transforming truth. And once you know him and he gives you that true liberty in the inside, in my culture for a father to apologize to a son is almost unheard of. My dad looked at me one day and begged my forgiveness for all the hurt he'd brought me and he himself committed his life to Christ. He's with the Lord now. What is the final strand? What is the final strand? Your faith, your hope in Christ answers the one question that the Greeks tried desperately to answer but could not find an answer for. What is it? How do you find unity in diversity? That's why America was created, by the way, a pluribus unum. And that's why universities were created, to find unity in diversity. <clears throat> It's been the pursuit <clears throat> of learning of cultures, countries, and so on. <clears throat> and what, what I want to close with is this, is that the unity and diversity that we seek on the outside <clears throat> will never be found until we find unity in diversity on the inside. Where do we find that? Archbishop William Temple gave us the definition of Christian worship. Worship is the submission of all of our nature to God. It's the quickening of conscience by his holiness, nourishment of mind by his truth, purifying of imagination by his beauty, opening of the heart to his love, and submission of will to his purpose. All this gathered up in adoration is the greatest expression of which we are capable. Quickening of conscience by his holiness, mind by his truth, imagination by his beauty, heart to his love, and will to his purpose. All this coming together from diversity into unity is the greatest expression of which we are capable. And so when you gather like this on this Tuesday night here and do so regularly, to be ministered to in song and to lift your hearts and your imagination, and to be blessed in the stirring of the innermost being with, with the stra strains of music, and then listen to the word to touch the mind and find that bridge and walk out of here to be connected with life itself every day. Worship is ultimately coextensive with life. If we are going to live in this 21st century with any, any impact, we are going to have to live with that kind of an impact where worship is coextensive with my life. Charles Wesley wrote this hymn, and with this I close, and I just want to say, you've given me a great honor by giving me a hearing. And I want to thank you so much for taking these couple hours on this weeknight when you could be doing so many other things to come here. I never take any speaking engagement for granted. In fact, I die a thousand deaths before any one of them comes, actually. It's a daunting thing to which I've been called, but the gratitude and affirmation that people like you give keeps us going, and I really want to thank you for taking the time to be here. <laughs> Charles Wesley, the great hymn writer, wrote this, O thou who camest from above, the pure celestial fire to impart, kindle a flame of sacred love on the mean altar of my heart. There let it for thy glory burn with inextinguishable blaze and trembling to its source return in humble prayer and fervent praise. Jesus, confirm my heart's desire to work and speak and think for thee. Still let me guard the holy fire and still stir up thy gifts in me. Ready for all thy perfect will, my acts of faith and love repeat till death thy endless mercy seal and make my sacrifice complete. To work and speak and think for thee. 
May God richly bless you in the daunting 21st century with the stridency of a naturalism, with the confusion of religious pluralism, with the seduction of the eye. You must know what you believe. You must know how to live it and defend it and ultimately find that confluence of all that God has created for within your own heart and build a community of men and women who will honor God and have an influence on society around them. God bless you here at Texas A&M and may he give you your best and greatest years ahead as an institution and as an individual. Thank you for having me.